Banking Service Livestock and Poultry Programs. Tonight's webinar is the final installment of our three-part series hosted by AMS in partnership with our USDA Cattle and Carcass Training Center at Colorado State University. We sure are glad we, you've all stayed with us to the finish out this series with our industry panel. I think we may have saved the best for last. The last two series have been awesome and I expect tonight's to be a hundred times uh, what we've seen the last two nights. Um, so let's go ahead and this evening, uh, we are excited to in introduce uh, to you three fine cattle industry professionals who've agreed to join us and take time out of their busy schedules to prepare and share their experiences with USDA uh, LMR reports and other USDA reports in the real world, so to speak. Each one will share a unique perspective representing different aspects of the industry. Now, I do wanna say that as, as industry professionals, these folks have agreed to share some behind the scenes looks at how they use the data. That said, I need to emphasize that no information provided by our presenters this evening is intended for uh, constitute legal tax or accounting advice investment recommendations. It is for informational purposes only. We estimate our session tonight to go a little over an hour, possibly up to an hour and a half as we bring back all of our speakers this evening to do a final Q&A at the end. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the USDA website within the coming weeks. You can find recordings and materials from our fall 2020 webinar series there now. I will advise that the listeners tonight are in listen only mode, but we, we, we will have an opportunity for questions to be answered during this evening. Please use the Q&A located at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom toolbar to submit your questions. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's first speaker and then we will get started. I will let you know that some of our presentations were pre-recorded before the event, so it just shows the dedication that these individuals have taken to, to make sure that they're presenting this information to you in a, in a manner that is understandable. Our first speaker tonight is David Tobridge. David manages the day-to-day -day operations at Gregory Feed Yards, which is a 7,500 head custom feeding operation in Tabor, Iowa. A little story about David, uh, when we, I called him last week, we, we had a time slot to, to do a pre-recording and I called him and he was elbow deep in a baler. He was helping a neighbor, a, a neighbor bale some hay. The weather was supposed to get hot. So him and his crew there at Gregory were working diligently there around the yards to make sure that waters were working fine and, and everything was up getting ready for the hot weather. So I really appreciate David taking time out of his busy schedule to uh, pre-record his session tonight and look forward to talking to him this evening in the question and answer. David is a graduate of the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. He is past president of the Iowa Cattlemen's Association, served on the certified Angus board, or excuse me, Hereford board, and is the past and serves on the board of directors for the American Hereford Association. David is frequent speaker at producer meetings across U.S., educating on the value of retaining ownership to add profitability to operations by collecting data on management, performance, and genetics. With 44 years in the feedlot management business, David prides himself in working with cattle producers to maximize performance and profit on their animal herds. Now welcome David Tobridge. Thank you, Jody, for that introduction. And I am here from Gregory Feedlots to uh, speak about how we use USDA reports and data to uh, project profitability into our customers' cattle. Gregory Feedlots is a 7,000 head custom cattle feeding operation in Southwest Iowa. Our niche in the cattle feeding industry since the early 1980s has been feeding retained ownership cattle for cow-calf producers or backgrounders. Most of our clients are producers with less than 300 cows. 
Our specialized services are focused on maximizing added value on each individual animal. We collect individual performance and individual carcass data on most producers' animals and return this data to help them improve their enterprise profitability. This process helps in refining the marketing process with each group of that producer's cattle. To achieve that goal, we need to assess the potential of each individual's animal, each individual producer's animal, and develop marketing plans using all available information in USDA reports that will help achieve an added value return. This slide is an example of the information that we collect on a closed out pin of cattle. We, we project this as we go along, performance data, uh, individual weights, uh, then we collect carcass information on each of the individual animals. We evaluate each animal based on the value of that, of that carcass and with a premium or a discount based on that. Then we rank the cattle in the individual groups for that producer so he can see genetically what his animals are doing. We keep, um, keep individual data on treatments and all the individual costs and, and predict, um, show the profitability or on each individual animal. We use a series of procedures to allow us to develop a plan for each producer. This process starts before the cattle arrive and will continually change during the feeding process. Market trends, cattle on feed, consumer demand, weather, and feed costs all have dramatic effects on our projections and our marketing plans. Our process begins when a producer calls expressing interest in eating cattle. We project marketing dates and the cost of gain based on client provided information when we first contact them. Then we just really discuss that producer's goals in feeding cattle and look at the future prices to determine whether or not those goals are achievable and what their real process is um, for achieving that goal. When the cattle arrive, they are individually weighed and graded for frame, muscle, and flesh scores. This process is usually done by the staff here at Gregory Feedlots, but occasionally we'll bring in USDA market graders. They come to our location, we grade the cattle as we're processing them, and then they uh, educate our staff on how that process works, and we can, then we can do it ourselves more accurately. Is an example of what the USDA graders provide for us to start with on the grading the cattle. We get a weight, an individual weight, an individual frame score, a muscle score, a flesh score, a value of the current value of that animal based on those three conditions, then a projected day on or projected out weight, and then a projected days on feed. So from there, we actually get a projected date to and we do cost of gains and uh, break evens on the cattle individually. From this data, then we project for the group of cattle, we project uh, an individual break even for the pin. And that information is based on all the information we've gathered so far to give us a, a market date, an average market date, an average market uh, break even, and to look at then what the CME um, market is, is out there and so whether we can project a profit in the cattle or not. But the main thing we're using this information for to start with here is, is our decision on whether to uh, market the cattle on a grid basis. So we can market the cattle live, we can market the cattle on a hot carcass weight, or we can market the cattle uh, on a grid. Most of our cattle are gridded, so we're looking at, at the value of each individual animal. Our next decision will be whether to use options or hedges. 
uh, or to leave the cattle open at this time uh, as far as risk management um, decision. To, man to manage this decision process, we look at the USDA cattle on feed reports, USDA marketing projections. Uh, here's some screens here. This is uh, the cattle on feed report. We, of course, we look at to see what the numbers are out in front of us. We also look at the individual months uh, as far as marketing, uh, when these cattle are going to hit the market as compared to what the numbers are in the USDA reports. We look at the USDA box beef reports, see what trends are, there are in that as far as demand and volume going on uh, as we go down the road. We also look at the five state or five area daily weighted averages of, of marketings to see what those trends are doing. The main thing we're looking, looking at these reports is looking for trends to be able to uh, advise our clients on the trends of what we see uh, heading towards the market date of their individual group of cattle. We look at several of these reports um, to see, you know, to develop these trends. We look at the cutout values. We look at how these things are moving up and down as far as how it affects our marketing. So we use several of these reports that, that we look at when the customer is interested in, in developing a plan. We also use, um, th well, this is another report here, but we also use the uh, USDA grain market reports to, to look at what uh, the trends in grain pricing is going to be as far as whether this customer wants to hedge his corn or to prepay or, or buy his corn. We take all this information and the profit goals of the producers to make our risk management decisions. We just base these on all this decision, all this information that we have. If these goals are attainable at that time, we will hedge the cattle, but if they're not, we will look at using options or some other um, price uh, protection program to get at least a floor price under those cattle to protect our, our customer. These decisions are up to the individual customer uh, as they, as they want, what they want to do. But once that information is all assembled and we are able to make an educated plan for that individual client, then we will execute that uh, that plan through the, the Gregory Feedlots program. During the feeding period, as we approach market dates, we continue to use all the visual appraisal of the cattle, the data we are collecting on performance, uh, during the feeding period, the trends in the live cattle futures, and the USDA daily market reports to make decision on risk, risk management um, moves that we can make on that certain pin of cattle. Again, we look at those same reports. We're using the same reports we were looking at before, uh, box beef reports, cattle on feed, the five area live cattle marketings, and use those to decide whether to add protection or to lift the protection that, that we have. As we arrive at the, the, the market time, we look at our original live cattle projections, our grading reports, and we look at the visual appraisal of the cattle to determine whether or not we're going to uh, sell the cattle either live in the beef or on a grid. We use the USDA carcass, beef carcass price equivalent index value to assess the, our, grid, our grid potential to see what our, our discounts and premiums are for the quality of the cattle that we have available for market. We compare these to what the uh, different packers are offering on their grids as far as premiums and discounts 
and then we make that decision on how we're going to market the cattle um, at, at that time. So all these things are fluid as we're going through the feeding process. Um, you know, a lot of our marketing will depend on what these premiums and discounts are on this report. We, uh, we did not have a full-time analyst to, um, to evaluate all this information for us, but we do get reports and graphs and uh, other information from a broker that we use. Um, they compile some of this so on a daily basis we can look at it quicker and have an idea of what's going on. But when a, when a client is interested in a price protection um, management plan, we pass as much of this information on to the, to the customers so that they have the ability to assess the information out there. You know, we, we look at these things several times a week, um, but most of our, almost all of our customers um, rely on us to give them the information because they don't have the ability or the access to processing the trends and, and uh, developing a market plan other than just watching the daily market prices. So these, this information that we can get from USDA is very important to our smaller operation and certainly important to our individual small uh, clients um, on the groups of cattle that they're feeding because a lot of this is done on the one group of cattle that they're going to feed the whole year and they have to make a educated uh, decision on how they're going to manage the risk involved in feeding the cattle that one time a year. That's pretty much our, our simplified version of what we do every day as far as uh, using USDA reports. And uh, thank you very much. And we'll wait for some questions. All right, David. Well, if you will join us, uh, we'll go into some question and answer. I appreciate your presentation. I know you are extremely busy. I've been up there and, and graded some of those cattle, those feeders, and and I don't know how you do it sometimes. You uh, you wear many hats around there, and, and I sure appreciate uh, everything that you do, and I'm sure your customers also. With that, I would like to ask, you know, with your schedule that you have, I mean, have over the years, have you changed any of the reports that you use to help you um, make these marketing decisions? Uh, certainly we have, Jody. Um, there's a lot of reports out there and every day I, I can find more reports. Uh, there's a lot of information there. Sometimes it takes me a while to understand what I'm looking at and I have to get some help on how I can use those things. Even last night when Dr. Coons was talking, there was couple of reports he came up with uh, while he was talking. I had to look them up on my phone to see what they were. And I think there's a couple of those that I'm going to uh, start using now. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Well, that's, uh, that's good. That's the whole purpose of this webinar series is get this information out yeah. there. So, you know, folks like yourself uh, can put more tools in their toolbox to help them mitigate risk. Um, you know, with your producers that you work with and, and you provide that data back to them and you're working one-on-one -on -one with them as their cattle are being fed out through the process, have you noticed that, have your producers, um, are more of them more inclined to start using uh, more risk management in the process um, to increase, has that increased over the years? Oh, definitely. Um... I would say that if you just looked at the last 10 years, um, the, the numbers have increased greatly on the percentage of cattle that we end up with some kind of risk management on, especially the last five years since 2015, uh, dramatic increases in uh, the risk and the producers are much more likely to look at these numbers and um, use the reports to formulate some kind of 
risk management protection. Okay, good deal, good deal. Well, we're gonna go ahead and um, move on to our second uh, speaker tonight. David, I appreciate your time. We've got some questions that uh, come in that we'll save towards the end and uh, let you answer those. Our next uh, presenter tonight uh, will be coming to you live uh, from Colorado. I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Jordan Levy. Jordan Levy is the program manager and founder of Arcadia Asset Management and the founder of the Fed Cattle Exchange. Jordan is active within the Cattle Association as in ex officio director of the Texas Cattle Feeders Association. He's a member of the Nebraska Cattlemen's Association and sets on the marketing committee at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. He is a graduate of Babson College in 1998, majors in finance and economics and completed the general course at the London School of Economics. Please uh, welcome Jordan. Thanks, Jody. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, Jordan. I only asked because uh, I didn't have time to, uh, pro to, to record my remarks. Uh, so I am the only live speaker. So I wanted to uh, make sure of that. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a real honor to be, uh, to be chosen to, to speak uh, to this audience. Uh, and to be uh, chosen by you and your department to explain to you uh, how we use LMR in the real world. Uh, just a disclaimer that uh, Jody uh, mentioned earlier, um, just kind of standard legal stuff. Um, and then we uh, get to today's outline. So today's outline, uh, we already received the introduction about myself um, and we will discuss how we use LMR and uh, other government data to, uh, to arrive at risk management or trading decisions. We'll go through how we organize that data, and then we'll go through how we formulate a thesis. Uh, we start with a macro thesis by looking at annual reports. Then we fine tune that thesis based on what we see in monthly reports. And then we try to get real granular and, uh, and test our longer term to medium term thesis uh, by using weekly and daily data. We'll look at some conclusions, and then obviously we'll take some questions afterwards. So this is how we, uh, first part of this uh, conversation is how we use livestock mandatory reports, LMR, and uh, other government data. What you're looking at here on this screen is what we call our research production schedule. And uh, I'm showing you about 36 rows of data that we take uh, and collect. Some of them come from the USDA library at uh, Cornell University, that repository. Some come from AMS, some come from private sources, some even come from cattle facts. Uh, in 1998, when I began to conduct or put together my research production schedule, this thing was about 10 or 15 rows. Uh, as I managed risk and as I stubbed my toe through time, um, I began to collect more data. Why? Uh, the reason for that is you would find out that you had a perfectly uh, great thesis, you had an excellent trade that was well-researched, uh, or at least you thought it was well-researched, and then you come to find out the reason that risk management strategy didn't work or that speculative trade didn't work was because of a piece of data you weren't keeping. One of those things might be something such as retail beef features, or perhaps I didn't look at the pork S&D uh, while proper, uh, properly, or I wasn't keeping my pork supply and demand balance sheet, and that may have influenced the beef balance sheet, which caused a poor trade. So in summary, we, we, uh, you know, we began, or I began my career correcting, collecting small amounts of data, and now I collect large amounts of data. What I like about the research production schedule is it reminds me when I need to do something. So on Monday, I keep these items, on Wednesday, as I do this, Thursday, Friday, et cetera, the monthly, et cetera. And then I keep the hyperlinks to where this data resides, and then there's a hyperlink to the USDA site so that I can pull that report and type it in by hand. And then I, uh, I express those reports via visual uh, charts. And then if you saw the entire research production schedule, it would tell you the last time I updated and when that thing would be due again. And if I hadn't updated, it flashes red. So I know that I have missed my homework. So how do we keep this data? We keep this data in Excel in tabular form. Uh, this is an example of weekly grading data that comes out on Monday. Uh, it's the weekly comprehensive report. Dr. Kuntz showed us yesterday where that data comes from. 
Um, and organization is key to me. So most of my charts look very much or very similar. Everything in black is hard coded. Everything in blue is a formula. Um, and if I keep that consistency throughout my, uh, throughout my research production schedule and within all of my spreadsheets, I tend to uh, make less mistakes. So that's one of the reasons we use different colors to identify formulas versus hard coding. We also look at our data in Power BI. What we found is that Power BI, which is a Microsoft product and is free if you are part of Office 365, allows us to do things more uh, precisely, allows us to express our data uh, in a better way visually and uh, allows us to manipulate that data and by manipulate, look at it in different ways add different types of trend lines. And so one thing that we've begun to do is remove ourselves from Excel and utilize Power BI to organize that data. What you're looking at here is a, a copy of weekly cattle slaughter. It's the report that comes out every Thursday, it came out today. And uh, you can see we keep cattle slaughter and we look at it. Uh, I can go back all the way back to the mid nineties. Uh, and you can see we're looking at it going back to 2011. And uh, I like to look at my data on a seasonal basis in this respect so that I could see the different seasonal tendencies throughout the year. Um, and then I can examine beef production, average live weight and average dressed weight. So this is one way that we, uh, we express our data when attempting to make risk management decisions or speculative trading decisions. So now that I have all of my, organ my data organized, I'm using both Excel and Power BI and gravitating further to Power BI, what do I do with all that data? The first thing I do is I start from a macro perspective. What you're looking at here, uh, or what you will see is the average cow herd. Uh, so we start with a macro thesis and we're looking at the beef cow herd that comes at the end of uh, January every year. Um, and we start with our macro, our big picture. And here we see that uh, the beef cow herd has been in a decline since the early 80s. But we also see that the prior one, two, three, four years showed some growth in that herd. Um, and so relative to several years ago, we still have a decent sized cow herd. And so we can begin to say, okay, today that may actually be potentially negative on price, but going out 24 months, that might be really supportive on price. So what we're doing here is looking at the macro supply and starting to determine how we want to examine or what direction we want to take our macro thesis. Another, another chart that we examine when doing this from a big picture perspective is feeder cattle outside of feed yards. And we see these are feeder cattle outside of feed yards as of January 1. One thing we're already noticing is that 2021 is equal to 2020. And you have to go back to probably 2014 to see another year. Um, and why is that important to me? Well, now I'm beginning to develop some analogs. So last year is potentially an analog. 2014 is potentially an analog. Uh, maybe 2004 is potentially an analog, right? And we're just looking at when the last time we had feeder cattle outside of feed yards at this type of level. Now that we've developed our macro thesis and we've decided whether or not we want to be defensive or optimistic, we start fine tuning that data with the monthly information we receive. So once you get a good feel for the overall trends, we start looking at monthly numbers and we're looking for analog years. So this is the total cattle on feed number and we use red for this year, black for last year, and you can see that uh, this is the second highest on feed number going back to 2011 with uh, that pink line being 2019, the last time we're at such levels. And so now we're developing an analog and we can say that, all right, well, maybe 2020 isn't the, is the analog for the cow herd, but what's the analog as it relates to on feed numbers? Looking at total placements here, and where we like to look at that on a seasonal basis as well, so that we can see some of the seasonality uh, in that respect. Uh, and you can see that there's only been two other years where placements were this high. Um, and so we're trying to look for other analogs here to tweak our big picture thesis. 
once we've uh, developed our big picture thesis and we've, we've tweaked it and verified with our medium term information, i.e. the monthly, start getting granular with weekly data. Is the weekly and daily data supporting our big picture thesis? Yes, one week shouldn't change that thesis, but we're looking for trends within these weekly and daily numbers that might allow us to either feel more confident about our big picture or less confident and uh, make us or force us to pivot on our big picture as it relates to our risk management strategy. So here we're looking at seasonal fed cattle slaughter, uh, and that's that Thursday report we discussed earlier. Um, and it may indicate that shorter term market challenges are ahead of us. We also have some fun with coding. So one of the things that we do here uh, is to take some of the data that we get from the LMR, AMS, and USDA, and we put it into either Python or R. And uh, here is a time decomposition of the same fed cattle slaughter data. And because this chart is so noisy, we want to take the noise out by using this time decomposition. And you can really see the change in the cattle cycle, right? So you go back to 2010, we had some big numbers, slaughter went down, right? And this is where we kind of put the, uh, the tightness or the, the, the tightest supplies. And now you can see slaughter is beginning to increase. And so what it really does is it allows us to take a lot of the noise out that you see here and here or in here. And so we can see, are, is what, are is what we've seen today noise or is this part of a broader trend? that may or may not support our risk management thesis. Here's another item that we look at on a weekly basis, which is seasonal dress weights. Put this in about two weeks ago. We're probably right around here where seasonal dress weights are below a year ago. And these types of things help us further examine whether or not the risk management strategy we have chosen is prudent for the market conditions. It's another example of comprehensive box beef. Uh, obviously an impressive chart. We notice here that the offtake and the price received for beef is outstanding. Nothing we don't know uh, if we're reading the news or being involved in the market. So what's our conclusion? Our conclusion is that the second largest cattle on feed for May 1, it's not necessarily a, uh, a positive item. The supply of cattle is extremely high for this time of year, but we also see a tremendous amount of demand for box beef and uh, both domestically and internationally from our research that LMR provides, AMS provides, and the USDA. And so here we are. Uh, these are our concluding remarks. We allow the user to decide what is the most powerful of all of these items to decide how to manage said risk. So when we look at the implication on May 1, there were 11.7 million cattle on feed in the US. We placed approximately 2 million head in May. Based on the previous cattle on feed numbers, there were about 171 spot two cattle ready for slaughter in April, but were held in May. In summary, we carried over about 171,000 head of cattle in April into May, which we deem as not necessarily a great thing. And this means that we have 2.28 million head of cattle needing to be slaughtered in May. Um, and so when we compare that to the weekly numbers of April federal inspected fed slaughter, it's 2.19 and the three month average was 2.14. So what this tells me is the market at this time that we did this analysis was continuing to hold cattle or was unable to get fully current, which means that it may or it potentially is not price supportive and may alter the original thesis or may further support the original thesis on a risk management strategy. So is it possible to meet supply? It's another thing that we did. You can see we use Power BI here. Uh, we look at maximum fed cattle slaughter and average weekly fed cattle slaughter. And we use this number of 525,000 given the labor constraints, which tells us this is about the maximum slaughter on a live basis. Um, that we could do in May. And so we ask ourselves, you know, can we get through the numbers that were placed against for the May timeframe, plus the carryover that we took into April? And so this is one of the ways we do that. Uh, and, and we express that visually uh, through Power BI. 
So the decision or the conclusion, cash prices may have a difficult time increasing in May, all else equal. Basic supply and demand says if there's more supply than demand, price tends to decline as we all know, and there's a lot more impacting price, but it's a starting place to derive a risk management strategy or a trading decision. So I thought I'd give you kind of a taste of, uh, of how we uh, manage or how we analyze and manage risk and uh, and hopefully that uh, was a good presentation and generates quite a few questions. Jody? All right. Well, thank you, Jordan. Yes, that man, that uh, was uh, that's a lot of data that you go through on a consistent basis, not only daily, but weekly. Uh, you've got to be the most organized person I know to go through that much data um, like you do to make these decisions. As, we, as you were going through your presentation, I noticed there was one report on there that you use um, in, in some of your decision making, and it's the re Retail Featured Beef Report. Can you expand a little bit to the audience on how you use that report and, and to make uh, risk management decisions? Yeah, I think what's important is, you know, Jody, is we keep a lot of data. A lot of times that data isn't relevant until it is relevant. And so what we're constantly doing is looking at those charts to see if there's trends that might help influence um, our big picture thought or help might influence our risk management decisions. Um, I think what's interesting about the retail, you know, uh, featuring index is sometimes it allows us to find other analogs. When was the last time beef was featured at this level? Okay, it was, at, you know, 2012, just throwing a year out there. Then we can go look at you know, what happened in 2012 on prices from June forward, right? And then we might determine or we might run some statistical analysis to see if retail pricing or retail features um, are a, a, you know, a variable that impacts price this time of year. So we'll run some analogs and we'll run some statistical analysis to see if there is something that we should be doing from a risk perspective. Okay. Yeah, man, that's a, uh, I love that response. That's a great response to that. Uh, I personally have worked on that retail beef report and uh, retail and going through those ads on a weekly basis. And so it's nice for, for us here at USDA livestock, poultry and grain market news to, to see firsthand or hear firsthand how our work is being utilized. So I appreciate you expanding on that. I'm sure we'll get some more questions here as we go through um, through this evening. Jordan, I sure appreciate your awesome presentation, and we will invite you back here at the end for more questions. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. So moving right along, um, I would like to introduce our third and final speaker tonight, uh, our third and final speaker is Spencer Prosser. Spencer grew up in a ranch in northern Arizona that continues to run a cow-calf uh, stalker and seed stock uh, cattle operation. I will tell you that up there on the mountain uh, in Arizona at Spencer's Ranch, the internet service is not uh, very strong. And uh, when we were recording his presentation, we had to do a couple of takeovers because he kept losing signal. Uh, he did assure me tonight that he was going to be down at, at his home where he had a little better internet. So um, just some of the things that we have to deal with in today's world. And, and so uh, we get through it and we move on. But anyway, Spencer, he attended Colorado State uh, University and studied ag business finance and graduated or graduate courses in agriculture economics. During and after graduation or graduate school, uh, Spencer worked for a live uh, futures broker, uh, uh, Compass Ag Solutions in Fort Collins. Then he later joined Adams Land and Cattle Company in Broken Bow, Nebraska in risk management before going out on his own with business partner Lee McGill oh, Glamory to start MP Analytics, or otherwise known as MPA. MPA currently serves a wide scope of feeders, processors, and traders. They have also recently formed a sister company, Landmark Advisors, which specializes in PRF insurance. Please welcome Spencer Prosser. 
Okay, well, uh, I'm Spencer Prosser with MP Agrolytics that we typically just call MPA. Um, I'm going to talk about both my experience as uh, an analytical company that sells research uh, to a variety of participants, as well as looking at uh, this situation from a cow-calf perspective uh, from my family's ranch that exists in, in Arizona today. Why is livestock mandatory reporting, LMR, and other USDA data so important? More than anything, it provides helps provide the one basic condition of a competitive, a competitive market, which is complete and equal information. We believe the data provides transparency and validation to affirm and direct a couple of things. First, market intelligence. Whether we're talking short-term or long-term market information, this market intelligence that data provides is critically important. You know, for an example, you know, how would we know what the bid ask spreads would be on tri-tips if no one had published that information? One would be able to find them maybe from multiple participants, but no one would officially know what anyone is actually trading for, for a particular item, much less the weighted average price. Maybe they would have their own seasonal information, but it would be a very hard piece of information to be found. Maybe a more longer term question, you know, are we liquidating cows today? Without having some of this data, it would be pretty tough to know other than anecdotal information that might be come across phones or social media. Another thing that we think believe it provides is market research. Um, so, you know, market intelligence, I think is very much present or hindsight information. You know, market research is more of a forward looking information. You know, we, we believe that having data and having information helps present, you know, expectations for market participants. For example, what is fed cattle supply for the next six months? If we don't have cattle on feed and some of these other items, it's pretty tough to know. Uh, you know, what are the long-term supply implications from liquidating cows? If we don't have a data set to be able to play with cow numbers and slaughter and other items like that, it is going to be very much a guessing game to what's going on within the industry. Lastly, I, and maybe most importantly, I think it provides um, or helps provide investment, uh, which I let's call equity and financing, which we can call capital, as well as direct policy. Um, as we, if you look at the industry from a macro perspective, it's it's much different scenario to go into a, a banking meeting or um, a policy meeting with actual facts of what the industry is doing um, as as an industry. You know, we can have intelligent discussions around data um, versus just rhetoric. So I believe these three things are key um, key things that the that data allows us to provide within the industry. So when we talk about data, um, I just want to give an example of what we have for data from the United States compared to the rest of the world. You know, when we look at our stuff, we got daily and weekly information for a whole variety of things that have probably already been talked about. From our perspective, that's cash and formula information, cut out, cut, slaughter, weights, grading, trade data. Um, then we got monthly information, cattle on feed, cold storage, trade and then annual information that usually involves an inventory report, among other things. Um, but that's a pretty big data set when you look at it. From our perspective, I bet we publish nothing short of 10,000 charts with just that data set alone. When you dig a little further to see what's out there globally, um, you know, Canada is probably the next closest with probably 85% of what we have and, and maybe not even that much, if I'm honest. Uh, there is some monthly trade data that's available that provides some quantities and prices uh, for, for beef. And we're able to back into other countries' information through exports and imports that I think for the most part makes people have to be um, at least factually correct with what they're doing, um, at least a, a disincentive to lie. And there is some data for Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and South Korea. Um, we would not call it extensive and in many cases, not even useful. The only item that is out there globally would be killer cow uh, information. It's something that you can find across the globe, usually on a weekly or monthly basis. Um, now, what do you, is that information super relevant? Not necessarily. 
um, probably the nice to know category versus the need to know. So in short, what I'm trying to argue is that there is no comparison to USDA data and the transparency that it provides. And that's the one thing I wanna leave you with um, in this discussion. So how does MP Agrolytics um, fit in within the industry and how do we use this data? Um, so I'm just trying to talk about what we're doing. And I, I think we provide four services um, in the industry. So first and foremost, it, it's data. We collect, identify, and store public. Um, so USDA, LMR data, um, as well as others that's out there, as well as storing private data. We chart and table all the data we can possibly find globally as it relates to cattle and beef um, and anything else that even indirect relates to beef. And then we take this information and we distribute the data to the clients primarily in tables and charts um, in some form of analysis depending on what fits the data set. Um, secondly, we hopefully objectively, um, we have a provide objective market analysis from that data. So we feel that we're paid to dig through 10,000 charts, data and research, as well as using our, old, our own real world experience to summarize what we think sticks out in the market and industry on a week, weekly to monthly basis. And we're hopefully doing this without any directional market bias. Um, and this can be a first, second or third party um, relationship depending on the needs of the client. But ideally, someone's saying, hey, we don't care if you think that the market's going to 140 today or 80 cents for fat cattle. We just want to know what sticks out in the data, what's going on in the industry. And, you know, as you guys look at it from an analytical perspective, what, what are you guys see going on today? And then the third thing we provide, um, we do provide market opinions. I can tell you today, um, particularly as time goes on, uh, I would say probably 65 to 70 percent of our clients don't want our opinion on the market, whether it's going up or down. They want us to provide objective market research that they're using for their own information as facts to help build their own opinion um, based on the information that we provide. However, the other 25 to 35 percent of our clients are asking for our opinion. And as we like to say, we like to present facts and debate outcomes. And then most importantly, the thing that I think we provide is we don't confuse number two and number three. We don't want to confuse objective market analysis with market opinions. We view that as very detrimental to the industry and particularly to our client base. So who might you ask would use um, MPA's products or similar services that are out there? I kind of feel that there's four main participants. So um, first off, we have physical industry participants. This is going to be, you know, cow calf, stalker, feeder, packer, further processors, retailers, um, and often brokers providing risk management services as well. Uh, speculators, um, these can be individuals, funds, CTAs, uh, et cetera, whoever provides market liquidity to take on the risk in the marketplace. Um, this also can be not just with futures, but also in the physical world with beef or cattle, futures or swaps. Lastly, um, industry providers, sometimes these third party interactions between veterinary, nutrition, animal feed providers will, um, you know, buy data from us uh, just to see industry trends or, or things of that nature that, that sticks out as it relates uh, to their businesses as they sell products to those individuals. And lastly, financing investment, you know, investors or financiers or in any of the above uh, may ask us to get information uh, that they use to help give them industry trends uh, as they look at their portfolio of risk. Okay, so practically, how do we do this? Um, I think this little flow chart is a nice depiction of generally what we'd like to say is going on in this industry. Uh, so we like to start a good 60,000 foot view with, you know, big picture data and trends uh, to provide a long term outlook or and, and that doesn't necessarily mean direction of the market. But hey, as you guys run your models on what liquidation is doing, what would you guys expect for slaughter, you know, for one to two, three years out? You know, then we take, you know, we'll look at it a little bit shorter term 
you know, whether that's six months out or maybe annually as we might, for example, take cattle on feed, look at placements and come up with a place against supply and say slaughter appears to be 520,000 head for the next four months uh, for the United States fed cattle. And then what we do with that is we're going to try and monitor that uh, with daily and weekly information. We might come back and say, okay, we need to kill 520,000 head a week. That means we need to be running 94,000 head a day, Monday to Friday, uh, with roughly 50,000 head Saturday kill to achieve that number. Uh, so this becomes a much more granular level to, to monitor what we originally um, are looking at from a 30 or 60,000 foot view. And then we're going to go take the 10,000 other charts that we have and we just kind of scan through it. You know, are we, is there anything else that we can find what's going on? Uh, that is going to change our opinion or what's going on longer term in the marketplace. You know, that might be starting to pick up on the drought in the Dakotas here lately. That might be picking up on something like fake meat that we've seen in the industry. It might be picking up, you know, China imports, which is the chart we have on here. Um, some things that potentially have um, the ability to change a long-term impact. So, it's, it's generally a big circle, you know, again, going from 60,000 foot view to granular and then finding anything else that might change opinion and, and bringing that back through the, the system. The other thing we do that we believe provides value is we build a lot of balance sheets. People are looking for us for information of what they view supply or demand to be as they look down the road. Um, and this is just a simple example to calculate uh, U.S. net beef supply. Um, ironically, this number you can pull from a WASDE report that gets published from them. Uh, and, you know, from our perspective, you know, I'm just trying to show here that it takes a lot of granular data to, to come up with that forecast from our perspective. You know, we're going to start with, you know, it, if we want to look at net beef supply, it's, it's not rocket science. It's fed beef production, non-fed beef production, or usually cow kill, beef exports, beef imports, and fed cattle imports. And although there's only five things, when you start breaking these apart into smaller components, it gets pretty big. Um, you know, I, I wanna say that our variable here to do net beef supply is well over 70 variable, variables at the end of the day that we're plugging with or, you know, estimating to come up with one number. You know, if you take fed beef production, for example, we gotta estimate steer slaughter and steer weights. Um, which of course there's monthly, weekly, and daily data and regional data for that as well. You get down to the export side of things, it gets much bigger as we're starting to talk about trends from other countries, um, you know, our own export data and the data set gets rather big when we start forecasting, you know, 13 plus destinations uh, for our exports, which of course is circular as we talk about our imports as well. So again, this is something we spend a lot of Typically use LMR data. Um, you know, from our perspective, we pull about 600 pieces of information daily and about 3,000 pieces weekly. Uh, so when you look at that, we people ask, well, what do you get with all that data? And the short answer, of course, is a lot. Um, we probably make over a thousand charts with that information, um, if not more. You know, practically, as you guys have probably talked about in other things here. We have, you know, on the cattle side, we get negotiated prices, weights, volume, yields, grading, regional information, forward contract information, formula information, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And very sim similar information on the beef. But again, this is a, a huge piece of data for us. Our Monday poll, and we pull about 3,000 pieces of data is, um, at least from our perspective, for not being natural nerds, uh, it was a lot for us to code and poll. So that was how I used it in, you know, MP Agrolytics, our research company. You know, the, the last two slides here, just how we use it from a cow-calf operator's perspective. Um, and as we dig into this, I don't think it's, it's super rocket science. It's a little bit unfair when I have a research company and, 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 and am inundated with data and now coming back to a, a cow-calf perspective. But this is what I would say. You know, probably one of the biggest things is fed cattle valuation. 
Um, you can help know what your cattle are worth. You know, we get, give you prices. You got a premium and discount report to know those cattle, what they're worth, if you know how they're going to clean up. You know, obviously choice select spread, prime spread fits into that discussion as well. Um, but it just helps ask the next question, which is equally important, which is, you know, feeder and cow-calf valuation. So, um, you know, if we want to know what's going on in the rest of the world, there's all sorts of national and regional summaries. Um, you know, the link on there is pretty easy to go through the AMS site and find more information than you probably even want or need to know. Um, I personally, I pull up Oklahoma City once a week, dig through those numbers and just get a weekly scan of what's going on. Easy to see what the differences are in slides as well for different weight classes. Okay, the other thing that we find it from a cow-calf perspective that has value from this data, um, I think are just industry trends. We talk a lot about revenue um, in our business and getting the highest price for our calves, but the other side is, is tracking input costs. Hay and virtually every other ingredient is tracked somewhere within AMS. It's pretty easy to scroll through in there, in there and find 10 years of data that will really help you manage that input side of things. Um, probably the most important, however, I think is, you know, liquidation or expansion that we call the cattle cycle. I think simply knowing if we are in a liquidating or a liquidation or expansion as an industry is one of the most profitable answers for a cow-calf producer. This is, of course, if you have the feed resources to capitalize on it. This is a slow process, so the information is not hard to find. Many extension services, brokers, industry publications will hit on this multiple times a year. Uh, so again, I, I don't think it's hard to find that information. Uh, you just got to keep your ear to the ground, um, and it does provide a lot of value if you're able to time that correctly within the industry. You know, one-off opportunities. Uh, you know, I think that as you look at something like today, there's regional imbalances where you're dry in the West and you're wet in part of the Central Plains, and you're able to buy cheaper cows out of one area um, at often discounted values because there's nowhere to go with them and bring them to other areas where you guys do have the resources. Um, and I think unless you, if we didn't have that data and it wasn't easily available to go find from AMS and other places, that might be a little bit harder. But again, you know, a drought monitor and paying attention to prices on some of those regional reports, it's pretty easy to find some of that information. Uh, value of grass or gain. Um, if corn is high, your grass is simply worth more. Um, whether that means you're doing something that's less traditional that you don't typically do in your operation, uh, be it stalkers or buying color cows or killer cows, um, there's some options that may you may not normally want to do, but that just tend to be an opportunity for you depending on the situation. Um, and lastly, you know, the slaughter issue, the COVID, um, you know, as we look at a situation today where daily and weekly slaughter levels have struggled for, you know, better part of a year now, um, pretty easy to click on a link every day and monitor how we're doing there. So that's pretty much it as I had from a cow-calf perspective. Um, as we look at, you know, here's just our contact information. Uh, if you want to get a hold of us, please reach out to us. The other thing that, that we do as well is we have an insurance company that specializes in PRF rainfall insurance. Um, if you're interested in any of that, please feel, get, please feel free to give us a call and reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, and I hope we provided some value for you today. All right, Spencer. Well, welcome, welcome to uh, to the live session of the Q and A. I appreciate your presentation. Uh, you, like Jordan, you have a lot of data that you go through, and 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 a lot of different reports that you look at. I guess one of the questions, uh, if you could identify your like your top three uh, reports from a cow calf perspective that you look at and rely on? I know you mentioned Oklahoma City. Is there any other reports that, um, that you utilize during that, in that operation? I mean, it, it's, it's not too hard. To, I mean, I'm gonna just spin that a little bit and say, you know, the national feeder report that gets published, it, it's, more, it's more than Oklahoma City, obviously, but it's kind of the same thing just because it's a nice national summary uh, to know what's going on for those prices and different weight classes and, sex 
sexes. And then I would say um, there's a pretty nice, uh, there's, I don't use them because we collect the raw data, but if I wasn't collecting the raw data, there's a, there's a comprehensive uh, live cattle market and there's a comprehensive uh, beef report. And I'm trying to remember the names, but they, they kind of comes on two different pages with a, a bunch of different charts. I think Steve presented them on both presentations the last two days. They're pretty handy little summaries to say, pull us up once a week and you got a pretty good idea of, of really what's going on. Okay, okay. So those would be my, my three points. Good deal. Well, uh, one other question I was going to ask you, with all this data that you're pulling, are, are you using an API to pull that? I know uh, Market News just moved to the My Market News platform here a few years ago, and we have that API function available now to stakeholders. Is that something that you use? Yeah, I mean, the, the funny part of the story is we spent, I don't know, not a year of my life, but nearly a year of my life doing the text files. And we we're so proud of that because we're not nerds. And when we got all that go to go through, we were very excited to get the API poll. And to be honest with you, my issue with it, it is slower. Um, it's kind of annoying from that perspective. You know, when we go and ping it, it we're asking for a lot of data, but I will say it, it's nice to have something that's 100% error free, um, but we, we do link to the API system. Uh, in the best way we can. And, and honest, we have quite a few clients that have said, hey, how do you do that? And we send them a sheet and, you know, then they can pull stuff as well. Uh, but we're very glad to have that uh, as, a, as an error-free tool uh, to just go pull stuff. Um, even if we're just looking for something one-off, it's pretty handy just to type something in, hit enter, and all the stuff pops up. Okay. Okay. So, so you said that the, the, when you're using the API to pull the data out of my market news, um, it, it's pretty slow because of the amount of data you're pulling. Is that, did I understand that correctly? Yes. Um, I, I would say compared to scraping off the old text files, which okay. we thought were pretty slick, but on the same token, uh, it was very easy to create an error with the text file. So I, I got to be careful with what I say. Um, but that said is, yeah, when, when we're pulling 3000 pieces of data, um, it, it's still pretty quick at the end of the day. We're doing that in probably sub 15 seconds. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Good deal. Um, we've got several questions that uh, have come through that I want to talk and ask to the whole panel. So at this time, I would like to go ahead and invite, invite all of our panelists from this series to join us on the screen. And uh, we'll kind of go around the horn and, um, and start with some questions. I've got a couple of questions that I want to specifically ask uh, our folks with USDA. And then I have a broad question that I want to ask uh, the three panelists from tonight and then a question for Dr. Kuntz. Um, so let's go ahead and start with, we'll just go in the order of how you present it. I think that will be the easiest. Um, Mr. Potts, you on uh, Tuesday, you talked about LMR live cattle. And one of the questions that I have is, or that I've received here through the this series is, how is the domestic and imported cattle defined and how is it applied in LMR? Yeah, that's a, a similar question that we talked about is the state of origin on Tuesday night. Uh, but uh, the, state, uh, the state of origin, as well as the, how we classify cattle as domestic or imported for LMR, is based on whether fed to slaughter weight. So um, an example of this, uh, even if cattle are born outside the United States and fed to slaughter weight in the United States, those cattle are deemed as uh, domestic. Imported cattle for the LMR regs are cattle that are fed to slaughter weight outside of the United States and delivered here directly for slaughter. Okay. Okay. That's great to clarify that. One other question that come in, you, you talk about live prices, you talk about dress prices, and then there's a box beef. Can you, a box beef price, can you explain the difference um, between those three prices? Between live and dress prices? Yes. Yeah. So um, live prices are cattle that are, are bought and sold uh, on the hoof, like they're standing there in the yard. Uh, dress prices are, are when producers are paid uh, on a hot carcass weight after they've been slaughtered and are hanging there 
in the cooler. Okay. One other question, and then we'll move on to, to Chris. Um, can you kind of share with us what the process is when a cat, set of cattle or a lot of cattle is reported? Um, I understand, you know, there, <clears throat> there's different forms that are used and et cetera, et cetera. But let's say that you and I are, are negotiating. You're the you're the packer. I'm the the feed yard, and we are coming to an agreement. When would those cattle be reported? So, like, uh, let's use for this example. Let's say um, we uh, agree to a price on cattle at, at four o'clock in the afternoon. Once that price is established, that will get reported the next reporting period, which would be the next uh, morning at ten a.m. We'd have to get that report out at 11 a.m., but it would show the price on a negotiated uh, basis if we if we did a negotiation negotiated transaction, um, as well as once those cattle are committed for slaughter, they'll get reported as committed, and then once they are delivered to the plant uh, for harvest, they will get reported as delivered. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you uh, taking away from your young family to be with us each night and uh, we'll have another question at the end for you. We'll move on to Chris. Chris, last night uh, we we had a question come in about the exports and not only the, the export product, but also volume of product. Can you expand on that a little bit for us tonight? When we talk about exports under LMR, as far as the box beef are concerned, the only place that we show any volume is on the comprehensive report, and that's on a weekly basis. Due to confidentiality and all the different variations of the cuts, we do not currently have an, a, a box beef export report that we show any prices on. Also, it's, it's of note, um, the FAS or Foreign Ag Service does put out a weekly export sales and shipment report and if anybody's interested in that and wants any further details, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll show you where it's at and uh, get you in contact with those folks too. Okay, well, I sure appreciate you clarifying that uh, for us this evening. Same to you, Chris. We sure appreciate you taking time away from your busy schedule to join us. So the next uh, question that I am going to ask is going to be to the three panelists that spoke tonight. And, and I'm going to give each uh, panelist, and, and then I'll let Dr. Kuntz speak after them. Um, but I'm going to start with David, and then I'll go to Jordan, and then Spencer. But the question that I'm going to ask you, if, if you were king of the day, and you could request anything that be changed or added to the, um, to LMR reporting, what would that be? David, would you like to touch on that? Well, uh, that's a pretty tough one. Right now my video is off, but because um, I think John's got me shut off, but um, I really don't have a good answer for that. Just, to really what I would really wish to have. Uh -huh. um, I have to think about that a little bit, but uh, you know, we have several comprehensive uh, reports that summarize several things together. Um, and for my operation, you know, the more comprehensive re those reports are and include as much data in, in different uh, forms together um, really helps me simplify what I do. Okay, okay. Good deal. Well, I appreciate your response. We'll have a couple more questions here for you. So I'm going to go ahead and move to Jordan. Jordan, it's your time. You're up to bat, buddy. I was just stretching. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you was. Getting ready. Yeah. Oh, what... Uh... <laughs> I mean, I, I don't need another thing to keep, uh, unfortunately. Um, I think I think understanding some of the formula trade on the beef side would be of interest to me. Um, you guys publish kind of uh, 
you know, uh, final prices on the live cattle side. I, I'm more, I'd be real interested to see how the beef is being priced on these formulas and, you know, and what I don't know, it probably doesn't hurt me. And if we learned about it, I think it'd be pretty interesting. Okay. Okay. Spencer, do you have any thoughts on that? You're muted, Spencer. Still muted, Spence. Sure enough, muted. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. I would say uh, the, the stuff that sticks out to me is I'd like to see the natural NHTC stuff split out out of the formula cash cattle stuff as well as the beef. Um, I mean, Grant, we get a branded number on the comprehensive report, but to pull it out of the, the formula stuff so we could see, you know, what are true commodity cattle premiums and what is or what are the, the natural program cattle, um, kind of similar to what we do to the dairy fed today. Um, I would say uh, the forward formula sales, um, we, right now uh, the, the formula data that we get is kind of a lagging indicator because it was on what was priced. And of course that usually means that was something that was uh, priced last week to be shipped this week or shipped last week. I'd say it'd be really cool to have the, the forward formula sales as guys start getting orders, um, like even, it'd be really cool to have the delivery time frame as well. So you could see that stuff stacking up. But it's one of those things that you kind of find out after the fact and say, oh, well, that explains that because we had massive formula sales that we didn't know about um, in that environment. Uh, and the same could probably be said for the, the, the cattle side of things. I feel like if we can give the packer uh, committed inventory as feed yards, It'd be nice to get it as participants too. And we do have a committed number, albeit that's a much more generic, simple one week assumption. Uh, I would probably say, uh, I'm really just doing my laundry list here. Uh, in the comprehensive beef report, if we could get a total all dollars in, uh, right now that, cal that cutout is being calculated just off the 30 or 50 cuts that are in that calculation. And so the other 3,000 HS codes, which by default are going to be smaller volumes, um, even though there's 3,000 of them, we don't get to calculate, uh, we don't see those prices pulled up into that comprehensive number. And I guess while we're still on the topic there, we could throw in the intercompany sales and case ready stuff that packers don't have to report today as well. So <laughs> you asked, you got a laundry list, but yeah, um, we did. those would be wow. the stuff that sticks out the most to me. So, so the, I appreciate your response. This next question, I'm going to, um, I'm going to uh, lob it off to Dr. Kuntz. Uh, Dr. Kuntz, we hear a lot of talk about uh, a formula library very similar to what we have um, in, in pork and in swine. Uh, can you give us your thoughts and ideas on that as far as regarding the cattle and the beef uh, complex? You know, I, I think uh, more information from the standpoint of uh, improving how a marketplace works, uh, more information is better. If, if people hear about things and they don't know about them, then, then lots of times we kind of walk our way down to, to it's, it's, it's something not available to me. It's potentially hurting me. And, and when I have followed through on those things, it's usually not the case. So, so in this context, more information is better. And, and one of the concerns that I have heard people voice on that is it'd be also nice to know how, how current those formula relationships are and how significant they are. Right? You know, are they, you know, and it doesn't have to be down to the animal, but um, is this a one-off that's used on occasion uh, and five years ago, or is it something that's quite a few cattle uh, today and likely next week? So, so some additional information from a library standpoint is, is gonna help the market function better. And, and I would think it would be similar on, on the beef side as well. I don't know how to ask about uh, the, how maybe confidentiality fits in there other than not revealing names because um, my understanding on the beef side is a fair bit of that formula relationship is some form of additional processing. And if it's just for one buyer of beef product, um, is it fair to show what they're doing or, or not? Okay. Okay. Well, that, uh, th that leads me to my next question. And, and you, 
kind of touched on this last night, and I would like to get uh, Jordan and Spencer and David's comments on, we talked about, you know, like swine, a lot of the formulas are based off of the live, are based off, there's some component, including the cutout. And, and you alluded to a little bit of that last night on the beef. I'd like to get Jordan and Spencer and David's uh, thoughts on that. I want to go ahead and start with uh, uh, Jordan, if that's all right with Jordan. And so the question is, should we be pricing cattle off the beef market as opposed to finding so a market for cattle? Let me rephrase my question a little bit. So as, as, you know, as, as we go through and, and we see a thinner cash market, um, do we give thought to using cutouts or other matrices to base prices in the formulas? No, I think, look, I think we, we've seen the bottom in terms of limited negotiated trade. Um, I think the answer is something around uh, the, you know, if you want to increase negotiation to achieve the Kuntz study um, price discovery levels, I think the answer is not the traditional cash trade, as we learned from David. The, the, the answer is to negotiate the starting price of that AMA. And so to me, the answer is negotiated grids. Because the worst thing that we can do as an industry is set ourselves back 20 years where everything is worth the same. We have finally got amazing offtake for our product. People are demanding marbleization. Why would we want to remove the advancement in genetics for the sake of everybody getting the same price? So to me, the best way to resolve um, what I believe we've already seen the bottom in, the best way to resolve the limited amount of negotiated trade is to start negotiating more of the starting prices on these AMAs and business to business relationships. Okay, thank you. Spencer, your thoughts? Still muted. <laughs> Spencer muted. So I'm looking because I, I got a duck here because I got clients on both sides of every argument. Um, <laughs> but what I would, would mostly say in this, truthfully, is that I think that. Um, you know, price discovery is a very important issue. Um, I, gosh, I'm going to afraid to get hit if I say this. I'm, I'm just going to step out and say my personal opinion, um, irrespective of my company, company, I don't think we want to negotiate 50% of the cattle. I think you're going to find that to actually be a liability in some instances because if an industry participant cannot carry those animals, it's not an asset to this discussion, it's a liability. Um, that said, I do believe that we need numbers. Um, I just think it's probably more than what we've been seeing, uh, certainly more than what we've been seeing, but probably not maybe as some people would like to see happen. Um, we need to have people negotiating cattle in that base price, whether, uh, and, and obviously negotiated grid seems to make the most sense to me as well. Um, it's a nice deal, too, because you get to see it beforehand. We also get to see that information cleaned up as well and how those cattle actually were paid out. So that's a pretty nifty thing on both sides of that. Um, I would also lean on this that, uh, sorry, guys, I'm having a, I'm skipping my, I forgot my other point. But uh, as, as we look at negotiated markets here, go back to 2014 we had the highest prices on record with the highest percent formula. Why was that? Because it had nothing to do with negotiation in that time frame. It had everything to do with a mismatch of capacity to fed cattle. Um, we were running with 20% or 25% potentially excess capacity in 2014. We didn't need as much negotiation. Um, and right now where we're probably running <laughs> I don't know what number you guys want to use, but I'm going to say if you if we were had the ability to kill as many cattle as we wanted today, we might have as many as 15% more cattle than what we have capacity for at this given day and time. Uh, you roll out two years from now with eight to nine percent new capacity on board, uh, the liquidation we've seen in the cow herd, I think you're going to find that 
much, much more in line in the favor of the participants downstream as you look forward. Not to forget about those issues, but I do think that it'll, it will minimize some of the problems that we are regrettably dealing with today that are not fun from a producer standpoint. Okay. Well, I sure appreciate that. Uh, David, do you have any comments? Well, I will agree with what Jordan said uh, and, and both Spencer. Uh, negotiating trade is, you know, a big issue in Iowa that we really push on, on the cattleman side. And uh, we have, you know, a huge amount of negotiated trade here. But the whole pricing thing is based on leverage, not really on how many numbers we know um, how many cattle were traded on negotiated, but leverage, we need leverage. And what gives us leverage is the value of the cattle, it's the value of the product that we're producing and the consumer wants. And so these value added uh, grids really help uh, bring that value up and give us more leverage because the, the packer and the consumer want those uh, high value cattle. So the negotiated grid prices um, do help us on our end. So I, I really think that um, I don't want to see it go to a box beef uh, percentage price or something like that. We need to just push ahead with what we have here and get um, a value added product. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kuntz, do you do you have anything you want to add to? I know last night you touched on it uh, in pretty good depth. Is there anything tonight you would like to add to? No, I think it, it just minor. I think we heard from the industry that, you know, the folks that are selling cattle would like some sort of cattle price. Beef prices and cattle prices are, are fairly different. So the need to maintain both of those markets is pretty important. The fact that we've got shrinking form or you know shrinking negotiated trade and more and more formula trade um, is is concerning, but the formula trades are are very efficient and those efficiencies do get passed back to cow calf producers. That is a that is a research fact and and those are huge gains for cow calf producers. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I remember last night. I think the. The line that you used and and, I, and it stuck with me is beef is not cattle and cattle is not beef, and and, and so, I remember that from last night that 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 I'm resonated not sure I'm with write me. That down, Jody. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, put put that out there as a hashtag. So <laughs> I, I might I might jump in and say too. Um, no, I don't think there's a packer out there that'll even let you do it. Um, I'm sure a lot of us or a lot of the feed yards would want to try to do that. Um, I just don't think a Packer's ever going to let them do it. But why would you want to at this point in the cycle? I mean, we, it hasn't happened yet. And I, I guarantee there's been people that have tried to do this. Yep. Yep. So good deal. Well, we sure appreciate everybody's uh, thoughts and comments and, and sure appreciate everybody taking, taking your uh, time. We have one question in the chat, two questions in the chat, and then um, I'm going to uh, kind of wrap it up. And the first question I want to talk about, I'm going to hand it off to David. And David, from your program there at Gregory Feed Yard, um, you know, from the feedlot perspective and what you do, can you kind of reiterate kind of the opportunities that for marketing cattle? And, and you mentioned something about marketing cattle on a formula basis. Do you use formula basis and what USDA data do you use? Well, we, we do um, sell quite a few cattle on a negotiated grid so that you're, you got a formula uh, or a price there we, we look at the cutout values we you know we we try to uh, find a grid that's going to work on the on the quality of the cattle that we that we are producing or we have available at that time um, 
So we do look at those uh, different uh, USDA reports um, to see what the cutout values are and, and how that's going to work on that particular set of cattle because you look at the history, we collect a lot of data on those cattle individually and we have a history on most of our producers so we can uh, assign those cattle to a specific uh, grid that works best for us. Okay, okay. Uh, one more, and it's going to go to Spencer. And Spencer, um, you probably saw the the question in the uh, in the chat, and I'll let Spencer and Jordan both, you know, um, talk about that real quick before we close this thing out. And that question is, what are the thoughts of LRP insurance for feeder cattle, and what are the pros and cons of the risk management tools, Spencer? Um, you know, it's, I would say it's a relatively new product since they changed the subsidies last July. Um, we've become much more familiar with it in the last year. Um, I think it's, it's def, it's very, very competitive to other tools that are out there. Um, I do think that it's probably better for feeder cattle than it is fat cattle when you compare them side by side as a product. Um, it may fit better marketing windows as well, or at least add to the list versus traditional futures for a cow-calf guy, because you can literally drill it down to uh, a day. Uh, so I think it's a great product, and I think that you're going to see, we've seen, ooh, I'm probably old, but well over 100, 150,000 head as of like January of new business that had grown into that program since it started last July. Um, I would wager there's several hundred thousand head increase into the program this year and we'll probably continue to grow over the next decade would be my guess. Okay. Spen uh, Jordan? Jordy, I, I don't know enough about the program to, to, to comment. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll just, uh, I'll pass. Well, so then that, so I got another question for you then real quick. Um, so you mentioned all this data that you look at, you hand entered that. Have you, have, have you began migrating over to using the new uh, My Market News API to help gather that data? Uh, the answer is yes and no. Um, so yes, in some cases, no in others. Um, I find utility in entering it by hand uh, because sometimes I'll notice something that I wouldn't if I just brought it in and scraped it. In addition, uh, training interns to put data in by hand is very useful. Um, I had to do it in 1998, and I'll be darned if they're going to get the keys to the car and, uh, and not enter it by hand until they know exactly what it is they're entering. You graduate to scraping data. You don't get granted the data scraper out of school. <laughs> there you go. So wax okay. on, wax off. There you go. All right. Well, I appreciate that. So, you know, we're getting close to being um, at the 730 here. And so I want to go ahead and, and start wrapping this up. But before we close it out, I want to give each one of the panelists an opportunity to give the audience a takeaway, um, something that they want to highlight if they have anything else that they want to add um, and, and just give, you know, a minute or so or less, whatever you have. And I'm going to start with Charlie. Well, it's been, it's been good to be on this program, um, you know, working for USDA, uh, for the public, for the stakeholders is great. We're here to serve. Uh, we've got a great team here. We're all really in tune about the work we do. We're, proud to put out data for interns to scrape all across the country. And uh, we put out a lot of data. So, you know, if you have any questions, just give us a call. We're, we're more than happy to help. And, and we're, that's what we're here for. So thanks, Jody. Thank you, Charlie. Go ahead, Chris. I'd like to echo uh, what Charlie said, but on top of that, please reach out to us. I can't emphasize that more. Don't assume that you know everything about a report because as, as soon as you assume something and you don't know what it is, you're gonna run into trouble. So 
call either our Des Moines office, call our St. Joe office, call DC, whoever. Um, but feel free to get a hold of us. We're here all week and uh, we're more than willing to help everybody and anybody from an intern all the way up to a uh, college professor, all the way up to the CEO of a large corporation. So all right. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Chris. We really appreciate your time. We'll go ahead and give David uh, the floor. Well, Jody, I'd like to thank you for uh, uh, asking me to do this. This is a great opportunity for me and for Greater Feedlots to get exposure. But uh, the biggest thing that I uh, take away that I want to say is with the amount of risk involved in this industry today, it is increasingly more important to have all this information available to all producers so that they, we can form some kind of uh, price protection for the future of the cattle industry. It affects all of us in every part of the industry that we're in. And this, uh, the future of our lifestyle and the things that we do are so important. And this information really uh, is a source of uh, protection for us to help us out. Thank you again. All right. Well, thank you, David. Thank you for your time. And, and uh, I can't wait to get back up there and uh, see you again sometime to work with you and your staff on evaluating uh, feeder cattle. And uh, good luck out there. We're getting in ready to go into a hot summertime. So uh, I know you're going to be awful busy. So I'll wait till it cools off before I bug you. Well, we got some Arkansas cattle coming up. You can come and grade them. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and uh, give Jordan uh, the floor. Yeah, I, I guess really I want to thank you, Jody, and and Charlie and Chris. I mean, uh, uh, one, they're not joking when they say call them. Uh, Any time I've ever called USDA AMS, uh, the answers have been super helpful. Um, and uh, any questions about data is usually resolved very quickly. And so uh, thank you for the great work that you and, and your team does. Um, and thank you for putting this on. I, I believe that, uh, you know, as a viewer last year and as a participant this year, and hopefully it, it continues again next year, I think there's a lot to learn from, from, uh, from the team that, that you have uh, assembled. So, so thank you. Thank you for your time, Jordan. Spencer? Yeah, I would just reiterate that it's uh, it's so nice to have the staff that's out there that's timely. Um, I don't know how many, I probably, well, maybe not hundreds, but probably close to 100 hours we've spent on time with a lot of these guys um, asking questions on ridiculous details that they're able to, to help us with, whether it's scraping data or AMS or uh, you name it. it. It's incredibly helpful. Um, and a great tool that we're able to, to utilize within our industry. And, and so just thank you all for what you do. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, appreciate, uh, appreciate your time and, and uh, hope the next time I'm out in Arizona, I can uh, look you up and uh, sit down and have a cup of coffee with you and talk a little bit more about this, uh, all this data that you look at every day. So I want to go ahead and uh, give, go ahead. I said, hopefully it's rain by the powder. I hope you do. I hope you get some rain. So, Dr. Kuntz, I'm going to give you the floor before I go into our closing remarks tonight to, to kind of give your thoughts of, of the big takeaway from this series that you would like uh, for our participants uh, to um, grab hold of. Jody, I appreciate uh, what AMS does for putting together uh, education materials. There's a lot of depth of information behind what you guys do and, and pushing some of that out for education purposes uh, just helps helps the market work better, helps individuals make make better decisions. Uh, I, I've appreciated the everybody on the panel's participation. It's, it's good to see this uh, this breadth of expertise uh, come together very, very efficiently and cleanly and put together a good education package. It's, it's very nice. 
Uh, in the end, um, I've always been impressed by the hard work and creativity that you find in the cattle and beef industry. There's just, you know, if, if you dig a little bit, there's people doing some pretty awesome stuff. And, and I, what I have found is that um, people who've created opportunities, you know, they're usually starting with looking uh, for looking at information they don't typically look at. So, you know, so make the effort to go out to the USDA sites, in particular into NAS and in particular into AMS, because if they have it, it's there. Uh, they've got the staff to help you uh, sort through it and figure out what you're looking for. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not really simple. It takes time. You have to invest. Um, but there's some real, uh, there's some real good information there. I'm serious when I say AMS is a gold standard on, on price reporting. Well, we sure appreciate that. I know our staff in, in livestock and poultry programs uh, pride ourselves in, in being um, servants to the industries that we serve. And we will make sure that we echo that to our staff as we move forward. Without further ado, I want to go ahead and, and move into our closing remarks. Uh, again, gentlemen, I, I really appreciate the time that you've taken out of your schedules and, and over the past months as we work to put this uh, special outreach event together. Our goals of the Cattle and Carcass Training Center activity is to broaden the cattle industry stakeholders' knowledge and understanding of the U.S. cattle delivery system and the information that you have all shared with us about livestock mandatory reporting certainly helps us with that goal. I want to thank everyone in tonight's audience for joining us. I hope you all learned something new and whether you're a producer, a feeder, a marketer, an educator, there's all facets or another facet of the industry. I truly hope this series has motivated you to start uh, looking at these USDA reports and utilizing them to support your business opportunities and operations. Please take a moment to complete our survey. You'll find the QR code at the upper left-hand corner. You can use your smartphone to take a picture of it that will send you a survey. We use these surveys to develop uh, future cattle carcass training events. So we do take them very serious. I hope you take the time to, to fill those surveys out. One last reminder, these presentations, including tonight's webinar, will be available on the USDA website shown here, as well as a couple of uh, copies of the presentation material. I expect you'll get uh, those, hopefully you'll get those materials within the next week, if not sooner. I do want to give a shout out to our livestock and poultry uh, team that's been working behind the scenes uh, this this whole week, we have, uh, you know, John Gallagher with Livestock Poultry, or Livestock Poultry Grain Market News has been our host. We have Sarah Hernandez with Quality Assessment Division that has been instrumental in working with our public relations. Uh, she has been a, a breath for me. She helps me put these uh, scripts together and, and keeps me organized. And that, that's a big feat in itself. She gets a gold star for sure. And, and then Sam Jones with their livestock and poultry programs um, is working behind the scenes with John to spotlight the features. And then we had closed captioning that was provided by our public relations. And Michelle, you've done an outstanding job. We sure, re, we sure appreciate that working relationship and everything that public relations has done to get these uh, materials and to get these announcements out to the industry so that we can make these um, presentations available to broaden the cattle industry's knowledge on how to use the services that we provide in livestock and poultry programs. With that, I want to tell everyone to have a great evening. Thank you all. Take care and have a wonderful, great, safe summer. Till next Judy. time.